So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bob Cheshire, who will tell you all about Tom Lawson and Dreamer. Bob Cheshire. Tom Lawson was uh, a hobby of my parents. They collected pictures and memorabilia. And, uh, my brothers were asked who wanted to do it for the historical, and they put me under the bus. So I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> But uh, he's an interesting character. He started out, his father was a Civil War veteran, died in his wounds. At 12 years old, he went into Boston and he applied for a job as an office boy. 12 years old, they hired him. His mother came down, grabbed him, brought him home. He pleaded with her. He ended up, they worked out a deal he worked there. And his job was to shovel gold coins into a bag on a scale. When the bell went off, they sealed up. So he decided he liked money. <laughs> so, he was a very uh, smart kid for a lot, a lot of education. At around, I'm not exactly sure if it was 15 or 17 years of age, he was uh, in the middle line business with the railroad stock. And you notice that the uh, Cincinnati, St. Dustin, and Cleveland railroad stock went from $30 to $3 a share. And he knew that that was not right, so he jumped on it and he made $60,000 as a teenager. Not bad, he said, I need to multiply by 20 to get what it's worth. Then he saw a Boston water power stock, he jumped on that, and he lost almost all of it. He ended up with 100 and, uh, let's see, 115, uh, let's see, he lost $59,841. He ended up with $159. That was all that was left. So he took a couple of his friends out to dinner. <laughs> The money that was left over, he tipped the way that he wanted to start over from zero. He wasn't afraid to start over from zero. Uh, by the time he was 30, he was a multi-millionaire. One technology is just value on me. But, go this way. This is him uh, as a young man. He was already rich at this point, obviously. Um, he um, was an inventor and an author. This is probably the first book that's ever written about baseball. Two and a half inches by two. Um, it was about what they call the crank, which today we would call a baseball fan. The cover was the leather from a baseball. Uh, this is a picture of um, a copy I got from the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame. It's one of the Library of Congress, and there's a few more out there. He also invented a baseball card game, which I have a copy of on the desk right here. And um, he had actually had professional ball players play this game. And you could get, if you made it to the finals, you get a silver baseball. And if you made it, if you were the grand champion, you got $500 in a silver baseball bat. His first home was in Winchester, Mass. And he never sold it. He held on to it until he lost his fortune later in life. That's kind of a crazy picture. That's Comedy Point of Brian's Boy, Bohasset, the eye clubs at the bottom. That's where he, his wife was sick, so he, she liked the salt air. So he rented the Bryant estate in Cohasset. Now, the Bryant estate is, is a Jesuit retreat now, but it's a cool, cool building because it was designed by H.H. H. Richardson, who did Trinity Church. And Brian's father-in-law was Olmsted, who did the Uncle Necklace. Olmsted's son, later on, did, did uh, Blossom Park for Boston. He ended up choosing Situate over Ohasset because there were problems with the deed. He couldn't buy the property. This is his house, Charles B. East and Beacon Street in Boston. So he had a little bit of money in property. <laughs> He also rented a suite of rooms at the at Young's Hotel in Boston also. He had an office at 33 State Street, which is right down the street. <coughs> he would travel all over the country. Uh, he was a big fan of Teddy Roosevelt's, and he would talk about politics and also about what he called the system, which was the stock market, which he thought was corrupt. And uh, I guess it still is. <laughs> and the insurance industry. Um, 
Once he made a trip by train, it took him a while to get there. We got there, and the speakers were full and didn't finish till 11.55 at night. So Lawson got up on the stage and said, you're going to hear a speech by a guy that's not going to give one. He said, it's 11.55, go home, it's in the paper tomorrow, read it. <laughs> His office on State Street, um, if you look at the statue, his watch is hanging there. He was very superstitious. He had a, a special watch that he had made by the uh, premier watchmaker, I think Tiffany says, Edward Combs. What is it? It took a year to make this watch. And it was considered as a good light piece. It was uh, an inch thick. It had chimes built into it that would go off when the stock market, well, actually 15 minutes before the stock market opened, when it opened, 15 minutes before it closed, when it closed, and then it would have the abbreviated time on Saturdays when it opened and closed. It would go off at night when it was time to walk his bulldogs, and then when it was time to head back home. You could also pull a lever on it, and it would come in what time it was within 15 minutes. He um, had other good luck charms. In his wallet, he carried 10 $1,000 bills that he wanted to some bets on his racehorses. He had a lucky 50 cent piece. He also had a gold coin. And his lucky number was three. He'd take the gold coin if he wanted to buy a stock, and he'd flip it three times. If it came up heads twice, he'd buy the stock. <laughs> he had other good luck charms, elephants with some of them. He had around 3,000, which we'll get to later. In 1905, he went out west to visit his daughter who lived in Prineville, Oregon. This was taken out there. I'm showing this because that's his wife. There's not a lot of pictures of her around. She died in 1906. When they were in Cohasset, they used to drive around and they stopped one day in Egypt. And at that time, most of the trees were cut down and you could see the ocean. And she said, this is a nice place for a little farm. So he bought a farm and then another one and another one and another one. And pretty soon he started to build Greenwald. He started in 1901, <coughs> clearing the land. Where did he buy them from? Excuse me? Where did he buy them from? Um, uh, coal, the first one was the coal farm. <coughs> the, the ones that wouldn't sell were the merits. We brought them a bunch of different people. I have a bunch of them. I have a name, so I can't remember. Once he cleared the trees, this is what he had. <coughs> Literally millions of rocks. The building in the middle of the, uh, his manager's house that he had built on Curtis Street, which is still there today. He had uh, 1,000 men and 200 teams of horses clear the land. Gave him bonuses to get it done quickly. And he wanted this, his estate built in one year. Some of the rocks were too big to move, so he dug a hole and buried it and put the road on top of it. He maintained his own streets. This is how he would take trash to the dump. And he would water, grade, and uh, take care of, basically take care of everything himself on his estate. He put up cedar posts every 200 feet. That's a, just a quick land that he put up. Later on, he had a made in his blacksmith shop. Some of the property he couldn't buy. If he did, couldn't buy, he just put a fence around it. <laughs> this is taken from Lawson Tower. Supposedly, he had about 500 acres with him at the end. Within one year's time, this is what we had from Lawson Tower. That's part of his estate, and that's the manor house. Tennis court to the right of that was a laundry. This is an artist's view looking the other way across the railroad tracks. You can see his racetrack and some of his other buildings. The main gate, if you wanted to enter his estate, and you could, when he first opened it up, you could. Later on, it became a little hectic, so he had to stop the, the building, which is called a lodge, and you could get a pass to the estate. He had his own post office to the right. All his buildings had their own distinctive sign. The wrought iron work was done in his blacksmith shop. This is the logo for Greenwald. Pegasus held by the strong hand of man. And this was on his books, on his blankets, uh, everything about the estate had that symbol. 
picture of his post office, the rocks in front would have helped you get off your horse via carriage. It burned down and it was replaced by the posting that's in front of it. Early construction, you notice that the, if you look through the arch, the main gate, you can see telephone poles and a muddy road. Well, he put all the wires underground, got rid of the poles. This is one of his daughter's weddings. You can see poles temporarily set up with Japanese lanterns hanging on. The telephone with his pole is there, so it's whatever. This is the main gate, they ended up at Brockton Hospital. This is a 1937 Packard an ambulance, it's a 1941 plate. Looking the other way through the gates, you can see the train in the station, that's Egypt Station. Uh, he decided when he moved to Egypt, he didn't want to make any stops when he went to Boston on the train. So he went to the New Haven Railroad and he said, what I would like to do is travel nonstop from Egypt to Boston and from Boston to Egypt. And if you lose any fears, I will make up the difference. Well, at that time, the train started in Plymouth. So everyone thought that was a pretty good idea, 30 years from Egypt to Boston, so he never had to make any difference. He also had a private rail car called Hazelmere, which he traveled around the country with. And let's see if I can get my point of work. That's Boston, and that's his son, Arnold. The lodge where you would enter the estate, still there today. This one had, he had set up lending libraries for his employees, and he also had a teacher, because some of his employees, the Italians couldn't speak English, so he had a teacher to teach them English, and he had libraries set up for a bank. The interior of the lodge. Dolly Litchfield was his personal secretary for a while, and she bought that, and kept it pretty much as it was. He had a riding academy built. This is early construction. Laying some of the rocks to the roadway in front. This uh, was second only to the Riding Academy at West Point. He put on shows inside for family and friends and some of the events in town. It would seat 3,000 people. It was eventually moved to Brockton Fair where it burned down in 1933. At one time, there was five in the town of making this the town hall. <laughs> Across the tracks, he had three broodmare stables. That's the end of one of them right there. There's two that are like uh, similar. They were 800 feet in length, and they would uh, take care of uh, 50 of his horses in their colt. He had his own railroad sign. He had box cars of Florida Cypress because it would make a good foundation for the project. One of his distinctive signs. Stable. It's one of the smaller ones. This is what the inside looked like. They're very clean. They were all heated. They had telephones, uh, electricity, light, and heat. We never go below 50 degrees at night for a cold day. That's the stall, 14 by 18. You also had show horses. The show horse stable. When you went into the lodge, you had the riding academy on your right. The next building would be the show horse stable. 40, 40 show horses and 50 carriages were kept here. It was also used for some of the parties for his daughter's wedding. He had a welcome home party after World War I was in this building. What it looked like inside. He had racehorses. His racehorses were trotters. <clears throat> racehorses and stables. Two 400 foot stables joined in the middle by a three story structure, which held with uh, recreation quarters and sleeping quarters for uh, people who were there. This was um, built in 72 days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he had roses planted up next to his buildings. You can see him climbing the walls here. The fire hydrants, um, the water department told me that this still hooked up somehow, but they, no one knows how. <laughs> <laughs> fire extinguisher on the wall. His son Arnold lost that one glorious whirling prince. 
Most of his horses were called gorgeous or glorious because that was the first two horses that he had. His prize racehorse. This horse was called the charity horse. Every race that entered, he gave the proceeds to charity. There's actually one race that entered it, uh, clipped its leg and couldn't finish the after gave five thousand dollars to the town of Brisbane. And he would give it to like the boys and girls clubs or whatever. It would race on uh, silver horseshoes. One of the horseshoes actually hung over the door at the lodge with all the was there. Glorious Fawny. This horse was entered in competition 45 times and won all 45. <laughs> This is Glorious Flying Cloud, one of his great horses, or Kelly. And they used to play, when his, when his horses would enter the ring of Madison Square Garden by the venues, they had a song called Glorious Kelly that they would play for Kelly. One of his stallions, Ponce de Leon. If you look at the frame, he had uh, the Prendergast brothers, who were uh, probably the best frame makers in the United States, they made frames for a lot of his pictures. <laughs> Basswood with gold. This was unusual because it was made up of Lydia and Stallion. Stallions would usually get a little bit jealous of each other, but these actually weren't. They were very good <coughs> and they, again, won every show they ever went. This is his uh, prize stallion, Diego. He paid fifty thousand dollars for the deal, which was worth a lot in nineteen oh three. And it was in uh, this was Dear Devil's stable, and he was the head stallion there, obviously. He had the stable built like a horseshoe, so that when the other stallions looked, they couldn't see each other. They had a little test each not that they ever did. If you look at the fence, you can see he's got roses planted at three other posts. Early construction, he's got, actually got a real lantern on the seat of the post, and that will eventually be covered with roses and vines. This would be heading down Lawson Road towards the post office. The, curb, the building right there is this blacksmith shop that was moved to uh, Captain Pierce Road. It's a home now. Uh, tree stump. You can see the bird houses up there. Yeah, <laughs> Charlie Vickery building farm. We had a farm up there. Frank Hammond is at front of the porch. You can actually shoot away horses at once. Uh -huh. He also had behind the blacksmith shop, he had a duck pond, which is unique because it was tiled. The floor of the duck pond, the bottom was all tiles. He's got one crazy goose that would come in at night, spend the night with the ducks, and then fly around the floor. <laughs> Besides horses, he had cows. This is his cow barn, which is no longer there. On Boston, what is not Boston name. He was home to uh, Flying Fox's prize bull. And all the and the cows. He had more Jersey, English, and American winners than any other farm of like size in the United States. You have a trolley went down to pick up the cow and the wood. And yet this is the only stable that didn't they didn't face up. He had to face this way so that it was easy to clean up. But uh, Flying Fox at an auction spent $7,500 for him, outfit the Vanderbilt's. It ended up, uh, someone offered him $75,000 for a bull and didn't sell it. This is probably the best example of a Jersey bull in the world. Ever. Mr. Robinson was his cruiser, and that's one of his cows. He had door knockers made for a run. All of his buildings. His sheep on the left, that was up on Utility Road. 
He had work hosts, this is the work host table. This was uh, joined to uh, this building, which is the farmhouse. They had a connection that became Sunlight House. Dining room in the farmhouse. He also collected bulldogs. That was his favorite dog. He had other breeds of dogs, spaniels, etc. But the bulldog was his favorite. He probably had, at times, 100 to 150 of them. <clears throat> they had their own chef who would be at the meals farm. <clears throat> Kennel is still there today on Bossy Lane. Just the main house fire. The rest of it is gone. That became Chase's Wild Animal Farm later, which became Benson's and moved to New Hampshire. Cute, huh? That's what he liked. <laughs> he had uh, his bulldogs when he ended them. <clears throat> Lots of times they squeak the competition with him. He actually had the best example of a British bulldog in the world, Green Wall Center. Some of the trophies that his dogs won. That's one that showed up on eBay. He had 3,000 birds on his estate. That's his poultry house. And that's the house today on Henry Way. He had a windmill to use on the farm. The building in the front is the fire station. And in 1922, I believe, the windmill burned down despite being next to the fire station. <laughs> he had a dove coat. The view of the fire station with the cow barn behind it. And this is fire pot. Carpenters were in the end of the speed and the other was for some of his wagons. The building in the background. This building, believe it or not, that's the sewage plant. He had his own sewage plant. The Bantam House, that looks familiar. Here it is in Noel's Center. Oh, yeah. The Google is on a farm on Grove Street. <clears throat> when you have a lot of animals, they might get sick, you need a hospital. <clears throat> so he had a hospital. The hospital is unique because there's two buildings that were the same. That would be Foley Stable and the hospital. The hospital today is on Country Way across from the OPS Memorial Library. That was moved in three sections by Percy Merrick. He had a racetrack with a nine acre polo field in the middle. It's got a practice ring and the outside is the actual racetrack. You can actually still see the berms you can take if you're on the English line. Judges stand. World War I, he thought the troops weren't getting the proper food, so he was going to convert Greenwald into a canning factory. Those are beans planted in the racetrack. He actually wrote an open letter to Governor McCall, and he wanted a letter in response basically right away what to do. However, World War I ended and it never came to fruition. They're laying out the foundations for the three broodmare stables. What's cool is if you look in the background, you can see Lawson Tower right there when it was a standpipe. He's got railroad cars on his private siding. Here's the tower in the construction. Three gates would let you into Dreamwell. These are the farm gates, which were on a branch. The Vanilla gates, which is called a flower way. You can see the roses climbing the rose bushes. He had 14 miles of fence. He had a crew of four that was in charge of painting the fence. It was actually not too bad until the roses were over. And it wasn't much fun after that. One of his three pastures. He had around 200 horses, usually. 
And when you do things in a big way, you get the tallest tree that ever came out of the state of Oregon at 318 feet and made it to a flagpole. <laughs> we shipped over by boat, they unloaded it, and they couldn't put it on a rail car, so they had to have teams to take it down. They also almost fell through the bridge, the old bridge at the Four River Shipyard. Excuse me. Actually, that had three flags. The biggest one was 75 feet by 50 that he flew on special occasions. Jamie Barry, who was a local town character, used to paint it. And he said that Boston was pretty particular about what went on, but he said that that was one job he would never respect. Curtis Street, the manager's house, still there today. Paint manager's house, still there today on Curtis Street. Then he had three cottages built for his daughter at the intersection of Curtis Branch and Country Way. His daughter Dorothy moved to uh, or, uh, Oregon. She married Governor of McCall's son in Oregon. That was called Western World. One of his guys known as the Elephants. Early construction of the manor house. There's no landscaping. This was actually the front. This faced, faced the ocean. This picture is landscape. You can see the flag in the front yard and in between the two chimneys he had a rooster put in because it was basically a farm. You drive up Lawson Road and you go around the, the manor house. This was the service wing where the kitchen was. This would be the view from the uh, Grand Street. If you enter under this portico so you wouldn't get wet. Out there. The dog is not real, that's a bronze, but the monkey is. <laughs> Did attack someone. <laughs> he had the lights, the glass was blown inside the uh, metal frame to look like a uh, longitude and latitude. The door knock on the front door closes the good black carrots. Reception hall was done in a dark, the wood was stained dark green, it was a Wedgwood pattern on, his, pattern on the ceiling. If you look up the chair on the right, you can see his tennis rackets, his tennis foot. Now we're looking the other way though. This is decorated for Christmas, you can see the Christmas tree in the living room. He had a veranda on the back that ran the length of the main house. The trees are bay trees that we keep in this greenhouse on Utility Road during the winter. The cushions were filled with pine needles so they would smell good. <laughs> Back inside, this is the dining hall. You can see uh, arches that he had painted at the farm scenes. And this room, the most of this room besides the farm was pumpkins. See the chandelier in the middle of Designed by Tiffany, it's the shape of a pumpkin with flowers hanging down. We have sconces around the room. That's the uh, lost and cut for sale. And if you went through here, there was actually a safe in there. And it looks, I've seen it, it's developed inside, it looks like it was put in yesterday. This is pumpkin. If you look on the wall, you can see the sconces of the blossoms. <coughs> Pumpkin motif on the fireplace. He had Russell Crook design the andirons for him. They depict the stock market. <laughs> one bee is, one uh, bear is fighting off the bees, the other bear is eating the honey and the stir. Centerpiece on the table. This sideboard is cool because up top he had a peacock painted in the gold. And the mirror would slide, you could actually hide stuff behind the mirror, which we found out later wrong. Some of the cut crystal in the sideboard, some of it was given to by Zan Nicholas when he visited him. Breakfast stuff. My grandmother said they used to put a silver on on display, so when you get your pass it, you could see all the silver on the table. Four daughters and each get married a different season of the year. This is the fall way, so it's decorated with the harvest. If you look right there, you'll see a clock. That's 
down at Six Weeks Federal Avenue, we will find them. Believe that I thought it was the horse Pegasus, which is missing. But he's got flying foxes ball, the windmill, and uh, across the cow. And of course, the bear, because he loved the bear market on the stock market. The living room, elephants on the mantle, Remington, a bronze by Remington called Coming Through the Rye, bust, bronze bust of Abe Lincoln. There was an organ in the room. The organ was actually in the basement, but it would come up through the holes on the floor because it wouldn't fit up there, obviously. <coughs> he had Vesper George paint the freeze around the, the wall at the top. That's Bacchus, who was the god of wine and vegetation. And that's one of his tribe bulldogs. Some of his elephants. He had around 3,000 elephants that he collected that people would give him. And he actually had one of the peppers who was in charge of counting. One night he thought he heard a disturbance. We called him in the counter. They were actually all there. One of his elephant groups that I found up for sale. Conservatory led to the bachelor's quarters. He had bronzes in there and ferns. The ceiling is tiled, hand painted tiles. He had a uh, company called Groovy Fans that did tiles for him. Some of the tiles, one tile could be worth $20,000 now. So they were worth quite a bit. I don't think anyone knew what they were worth at the time. He had a lot of bronzes made by Anna Hyatt Huntington. He basically, he liked her style and he told her that whatever she made, he'd buy. So he had a lot of them. Picture in the back is by uh, Frederick Bridgman, who went to Egypt and uh, Algeria and Nubia. He was actually unique because they let him in the harems to draw pictures of the girls. That's Don Quixote by Cyrus Dallin, who also did uh, Appeal to the Great Spirit that's in front of the Museum of Fine Arts. This was auctioned off in 1923 as part of Lawson's estate and then it disappeared and it wasn't found until recently. Paul Jamming did this on the defense. This is also one of his paintings that was for sale. And this is done by Herman Atkins McDeal. It's called Returning the Snakes. There's a whole museum of his artwork. One of the bedrooms upstairs, yeah, all of the fireplaces were carved or had.